Our next speaker is Dr. James Lowe from the College of Veterinary Medicine at um, the University of Illinois at Urbana, Illinois, USA. And I didn't write down your topic because there, there it is. Good. Effects of castration and castration method on growth, morbidity, and mortality in bulls 30 to 50 days post entry to the feed, feed yard. Welcome. Thanks, Dr. Hilton. So uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak today and, and really talk about a subject that in 2016, I can't believe we're having this conversation in the United States, but I have the opportunity to work with uh, some, some really good large feed yards in the Western United States. And so these yards would typically be north of 10,000 head up to 80,000 head. And as we look at this, we still see a tremendous number of, of animals showing up for the feeding period. So those of you not familiar with the U.S. feeding period, we tend to feed cattle of two different groups. And so either we take wean calves, so uh, typically uh, 200 to 250 kilo calves, it would be six to seven months of age, would be weaned and brought immediately to the feed yard, and those would be feeder calves. Uh, or we take animals that have been weaned and then placed on grass or in a backgrounding yard somewhere. Uh, until they're approximately a year of age and would be fed as yearlings and would typically weigh between 300 and 400 kilos when they arrive, sometimes up to 450 kilos. So we kind of feed these two classes of cattle, but in both of those classes, we continue to see animals with testicles arriving in the feed yard. And so those are effectively referred to as cutting bulls. Uh, we do not feed bulls in the United States. Uh, they are not acceptable for slaughter within our main slaughter channels. Uh, and have to be slaughtered as bull meat, which has a significantly lower value. So we have to figure out a way to castrate these animals uh, prior to putting them in that feeding period. So we ask a very practical question uh, with a couple of my students uh, and, and one of my partners, how do we work through this process in a manner that's both welfare friendly uh, and production friendly, uh, because we got to stay in business as we're feeding cattle these days. So. That's, that's a bit of it, but if you think about it, there's been a lot of discussions in the literature about what's the appropriate way to castrate cattle. Uh, and we would argue that best welfare practice is nothing that I'm talking about today. It would be to remove those testicles at birth uh, or shortly after birth, no later than the, what we would call the branding period at about 60 days of age uh, to castrate those bulls. The practical issue is, is that that doesn't happen, so we have to come up with another way to deal with these bulls that show up, show up in our feedlots. We want to look at pain control, where a lot of the work has been done, but nobody's really looked at the production performance on these. And if you, if you listen to Stan Curtis, uh, who we had the good fortune of studying under, Stan produced a production axiom. And Stan says that good welfare is associated with good performance. It's an objective way to measure welfare, because if animals have poor welfare, there is no way that they can achieve their genetic potential with respect to growth and reproduction. So we said, let's look at performance as a way to measure this and some behavior traits at the same time to say, what are we doing with respect to castrating these animals when they arrive in our feed yards? So this is, I was arguing, we still place a lot of bulls. This is a data set uh, out of the Production Animal Consultation Group, uh, represents about two and a half million head of cattle on feed or about today, about 18% of the cattle on feed in the United States. So it's a relatively representative data set. But as you'll notice, we still place a lot of bulls, about something about uh, one and a half, between one and one and a half percent of the cattle placed in feed yards uh, have testicles when they arrive today. So that's, um, that's unfortunate uh, that, that we've got uh, that many bulls that show up, but it is a real problem that we clinically have to deal with. So how do we optimize the welfare of these guys when they show up? Uh, and how do we optimize the welfare of our producers economically to ensure that we achieve optimum levels of performance? So we had a large feed yard in central Kansas. We utilize for this. They've historically purchased, um, in U.S. parlance, opportunity cattle. <laughs> and opportunity cattle mean that they're cheap, probably are commingled, probably have a significant number of cutting bulls in those groups. But producers buy them because they can buy them cheap enough relative to market price to outweigh the risk. So there are yards that specialize in feeding this cattle. The yard we did this work at, about 50% of the cattle they purchase would be opportunity cattle, high-risk cattle that come in at the time of arrival. So what did we do? We put together a factorial design with the main effect of castration. There were three groups. Uh, as I said, these groups would come in uh, mixed. 
So we had steers in these pens, we had bulls in these pens, and those bulls, we decided we were gonna castrate one of two ways. We'd either use a bander or a calicrate bander, uh, which is an elastic band placed at the neck of the scrotum, uh, and it restricts blood flow to the testicles. It would be a popular way to castrate large bulls in the U.S. because it doesn't produce an open surgical wound, or we surgically castrated these bulls with intertesticular lidocaine. So when the cattle arrived in the feed yard, we split these cattle into four groups. We had this planned ahead of time. Within those four pens, so each pen served as a replicate, we had 12 head per treatment groups. So out of the pen of approximately 100, there were 36 that were on trial. So we had 144 head in the total study. We just used a mixed model ANOVA and R to do the analysis. Now the important part is here we used within pen replication so that we could use individual animals as our experimental unit so that we could take out the effects. And when you do studies in feedlots, the biggest effect in any study is almost always the pen and how well that pen performs. So this was the same six or eight loads of cattle that got split up across four pens. We allocated them at arrival. We waited 40 days from the time they were placed until the time we processed them. That would be standard procedure in this yard to handle these high-risk cattle. So these were not cattle immediately prior to shipping or immediately following shipping who were castrated or put on study, but cattle that were in the yard for 40 days. So they were enrolled 40 days post-entry. We tagged them. We waited. We knew what was happening. They were allocated to treatment at the time of arrival. As I said, we used a calicrate bander. Uh, without any adjunctive anesthesia, which would be the normal procedure. And then we used uh, surgically, uh, used a Newberry knife uh, to incise the bottom of the testicle, and we put five cc's of intertesticular lidocaine in each calf. Steers were run through the chute just as the bulls were stopped, held, squeezed, everything was the same. Their tail was raised, but we did not castrate them because they obviously did not have any uh, testicles. They were revaccinated at that time, and all cattle received the same vaccination. So we got weights on these cattle, we looked at morbidity, we looked at mortality, and most importantly, we looked at feed intake on these guys. And the good part about US feed yards is we deliver feed two to three times a day, with a very accurate weight on how much feed was delivered to that pen. So we knew the pen level feed intakes, but then we observed how frequently those cattle approach the brunk. So cattle which are stressed don't wanna come up and eat out of this feed bunk, which is where feed is delivered. So we were looking for a behavioral change in these critters to say, ah, if they hurt, they were painful, they didn't want to carry on, were they going to behave differently than the steers? And that was really the, the point of that deal. So what did we see? So we weighed these cattle at three time points. So this is enrollment. This is at re-implant, which is approximately 90 days prior to harvest. And then this was pre-harvest, so we weighed these cattle off on a fixed day. Um, and we weighed them all on the same day, and it was about six days before they ended up going to slaughter. So they were weighed on a fixed, fixed period six days before, uh, before placement. These are uh, least square means, but you'll notice there is absolutely no difference between treatments. Uh, the, the control of the castrates will grow a little faster here, but that's not statistically different. So we can see from this, at least over the about 90 days between enrollment and re-implant, there was no difference in growth rate on any of the in any of the procedures with which we performed. Either the controls, uh, the controls were not different than the, than the treatments, and the two treatments were similar. So when we looked at behavior, we got a little more interesting, but uh, still not earth shattering. So on day one, there's no difference, and this is the percent of cattle approaching the bunk. So we followed the feed truck. Again, a feed truck drives down the alley, drops feed out. We sat there had our cattle marked uh, with colors and then with ear tags, so we knew them individually. We sat and recorded what percentage of those approached the bunk within 20 minutes, which is the normal feeding period as they're gonna come up. We had no differences on day one. We had no differences on day two. And on day three, we actually saw these banded cattle eat a little more frequently than these uh, than the, the steer mates next to them. Remember, these cattle have been together for 40 days, and there may have been some social structure things that happened. So we may have had a bit of these cattle backing off here, and here they were just reasserting their dominance as bulls. We don't know. Doesn't appear to be statistically significant, or biologically significant, excuse me, in spite of its statistical significance, because again, these cattle didn't gain, any, gain weight any differently uh, over this entire period. So where does that leave us? Well, one, 
over the entire feeding period, which is what our producers are interested, our cattlemen are interested in saying, what's the weight gain difference and what's the approach I should use? Number one, there wasn't any difference in weight gain over that feeding period. Would suggest, at least from a long-term standpoint, there were no welfare differences, which is a bit hard to believe, between the castrates of either form and the steers that showed up. There were no differences in feeding behavior, which resulted in no changes in weight grain, and pre-enrollment treatment, i.e., were they morbid? Did we have any morbidities prior to enrollment? Because remember, cattle get sick, and we'll talk about that in the next talk, immediately after placement. That's our highest peak. Our peak in morbidity, respiratory morbidity, is about two weeks post-placement in these cattle. We didn't have any difference in morbidity, so morbidity didn't explain what was happening, happening in the performance either. So what does this all mean? I don't want anybody to walk out of here today and suggest that we ought to wait to 500 kilos to castrate bulls. It's completely and utterly inappropriate. But in the U.S. industry, the reality is we have a lot of bulls that make it to 3, 4, 5, 600 kilos. Well, not 600, 3, 4, 500 kilos that still have testicles and they must be removed prior to slaughter if we're going to optimize value out of those animals. So we still need to castrate these cattle early and we still need to advocate that. We still need to think about how are we going to work on our producer education better in the U.S. to make this happen. The thing that's interesting is, one, these cattle were sick. They didn't perform optimally, even the steers didn't grow the way we wanted them to, so there may be an ancillary drag on respiratory health just not allowing the differences to be expressed. So that's a reasonable interpretation. But this really points out a big flaw in the U.S. beef industry that the average cow herd size in the United States is 30 head. The average pen of feedlot cattle is 200. We feed by single sex and by single weight. So that means if I've got a 30 head cow herd, I've got 15 steers, I'm probably going to split them into a couple of groups. So the average pen of cattle in the United States has got 20 plus sources in it. Now we got a lot of pens that got 200 cattle that came off of one ranch. But we got a lot more pens, in fact the vast majority of pens that came off of, uh, came off of 30, 40, 50 sources that got put together to make a pen of feeders. This disconnect with respect to ownership and professionalism of livestock care is probably the biggest risk the U.S. beef industry has today. If you have 30 cows in the United States, that is not your job. It takes probably somewhere between three and 500 cows to consider that making that a living. So if you have less than 300 cows, you're not really a professional cow farmer. You have four-legged grass mowers. They are there to consume grass and use resources that are not available. And so those producers that own those small cow herds are not necessarily incented to create value down the chain. So we have genetic challenges there. We have health challenges there. We have welfare challenges there. And yet they show up in a feedlot industry that is by far the most professional in the world. It's well managed, it's tightly managed, it is super efficient um, with intense record keeping and management. So we've got a discordance of what's happening in the US and I think it will continue to be one of our challenges. I spent a fair amount of time working in the pig industry, which is exactly the opposite. We're completely integrated all the way into packing, much like the chicken business. And so we have very different drivers, very different decision models. Uh, very different thought processes, and the beef industry is going to have to figure out um, figure out how we get that sorted. As a wrap up, if you got big bulls and you got to castrate them, the take home here is it doesn't matter, right? One could argue we could just get them castrated, and I think one of the questions we're going to have to ask is should we feed these bulls and figure out a way to change marketing rules so we can sell these bulls as as feedable animals? If can, this continues to be a welfare discussion. So thank you and happy to answer any questions. Questions, please? Yeah. Um, yeah. Where, where I you? think that I, I think your observation that um, the I think your observation that there's a uh, 
not enough disincentive on these small producers probably isn't accurate. It's probably the other way around. It's probably not, a, not enough positive enforcement or incentive on the other end on the people I should do it right to really reward them to show a real difference. Um, I mean, this past year, you could take miserable things a sale yard and get really good money for them, regardless what they were. If they could walk, they're worth money. Um, and even now, when things have fallen back some, there's really not as, you know, as big a uh, um, difference in money uh, per pound uh, that's paid to, uh, to kind of explain everything, which kind of makes me think that maybe it's not that important in the first place. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not knocking what you're saying. I, I, I believe what you're saying is true, but at the same time, if you look at the actual money in it, you have to think, hmm, <laughs> you know, if it's so darn important, then... Well, the market usually talks about importance real fast. So I think that what you're lamenting is what we all lament, but at the same time, it, it, I, I think that, 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 that there are some producers that have very profitable cattle for uh, feed yards, and they don't, I don't think they get properly uh, 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 um, compensated. Uh, because I know that a lot of things you're talking about, the things with horns, testicles, no vaccination, no nothing. A lot of those cattle I don't think are profitable unless things are really, really good, unless you're buying really, really cheap. So it just, it, it kind of reflects on the whole thing with a big question mark, I think, on like, how the hell does this work? You know, just an observation. It's, uh, I would love to engage in that. That's about a three hour conversation about the economics of the U.S. cattle business. And I will have one, com one comment to that. And um, being a livestock owner, spending a lot of time with that, anybody who tells you that they're giving you a bonus or a premium, that just means everybody else is getting discounted because the entire world works off of discount schedules, not uh, not not pargin. And, and there's a strong argument, cattle buyers don't have enough discipline uh, to discount those cattle appropriately to send the right market signals. And that's, you know, partially because we've got too much bunk space, et cetera, uh, and cheap corn. But that's uh, that's another whole deal. Yes, sir. Dr. Lowe, I may have missed this, but did you calculate the morbidity and mortality from day zero through harvest and see if there was a difference between steers versus those castrated with a band versus those that were castrated with a knife. So we, post castration, there were no morbid or um, more, no cattle got treated and no cattle died out of the subset that we had in each treatment. So there were only 36 per treatment. So it study probably was not powered to pick up differences in morbidity. Uh, the morbidity rates prior to um, castration, prior to enrollment, those first 40 days were actually higher in the steers and less in the bulls, but it wasn't significant. Uh, just numerically, it was different. So there wasn't anything there. But again, that study wasn't powered adequately enough to pick up those differences in morbidity and mortality. And again, 40 days post-placement when these cattle got enrolled. And so if we'd have done this at placement, i.e. following transport from these cattle came out of Alabama, I believe, into central Nebraska, I said Kansas, but central Nebraska, 20 hours on the truck. Uh, if you'd have, we'd have worked them and cut them the next day, that would probably had a very different outcome than doing this 40 days post-placement after they'd gotten up on feet. 